Hello and welcome. In this game, Lila proves again that she is arguably the best French defense player in the world right now. I was intending to continue my Amazing Move series, but these two men, they keep punching each other in the face really hard in this uh, TCC Super Final. And in this game, number 63, Lila played a beautiful and quite jaw-dropping French defense with uh, some moves that took me quite some time to understand. Now, when I hear Lila playing the white side of the French defense, I know immediately that it was something spectacular. She just loves smashing everyone in the French. And this is not really a big surprise, considering that Lila plays the French defense the most in her training games. She literally has many million games in this opening with both white and black, so she probably is the best player in the French at this point. The game starts with e4, e6, d4, d5, knights out, bishop g5, bishop b4, entering the McCutcheon variation, and now e5, and this is all theory, has been played thousands of times. Now, white is not winning the pin knight because of the a6 counterattack, and if white takes the knight, black takes the bishop, and white temporarily can win a pawn, but after rook g8, black will regain his pawn and will be at least equal, having more central pawns. He will also probably castle queenside and uh, will have a stress-free game. If instead of taking the knight, the bishop retreats to h4 to maintain the pin, then uh, black plays g5, breaking the pin, and uh, white has nothing better than bishop g3. And after knight e4, black has an easy game. If instead, pawn takes the knight, then um, after black takes the bishop, white can't really hold on to the f6 pawn because of knight d7, and after recapturing, white will be a pawn down. So after h6, if you don't capture the knight, then he will always want to jump to e4 and attack the pin knight. So why does best either to play bishop d2 to break the pin, or to play bishop e3 as in the game, with the idea to reply to knight e4 with the counter-attacking queen g4. Now knight c3 is not possible because after queen g7 and rook f8, white doesn't take the knight that would lose the rook, but it would play a3, and after bishop a5, bishop a6, threatening to take the rook. This is the same pattern that we saw in the beautiful Sicilian pin variation played between Tisdall and Lee in the Amazing Move series. There's a link on the screen if you want to see it. So now, after knight d7 defending the rook, bishop d2, and white will get back his piece by taking one of these and will be also two pawns up. So black doesn't have time to take with the knight, and he plays king f8. And this is where the book moves end, and the engines need to start working for themselves. Lila plays a3, and after takes, takes, knight c3, white is a pawn down, but uh, black is stuck in the center with the king and white has an initiative and can start attacking on the king side. Now, if you ever need guidance for deciding on which side of the board you should play, when the center is closed, you need to look in which direction your center pawns are pointing. For white, is that way, that's where your target is. Similarly for black, that way. Now, why do you think that's the case? Well, because that's where each side has its space advantage, that translates to more room to move pieces around. And equally important, that's where the opponent has the least amount of room to move its pieces around. More space means faster and more aggressive positioning of the pieces than the side with less space. Now here, Lila played bishop d3, stockfish replied with b6. And probably the idea is to take back with the pawn if after c5 white takes. And there's also the bishop a6 idea exchanging black's bad bishop, stuck behind his pawns, for white's good bishop. In the other game, uh, Lila with black played bishop d7, and the game eventually ended in a draw. So after b6, Lila played 
h4 gaining space and uh, restricting black pawns. Knight c6, h5 gaining even more space and uh, fixing the targets before the attack. Bishop d7, knight e2 takes and queen takes. Now black should play on the queen side but it should also strike in the center. This is very important because if black doesn't try to mess with the central white pawns, white will be victorious. His attack is directly on the king which is much more dangerous than uh, black's attack on some queenside pawns and the uh, heir. So black needs to keep white very busy in the center and the queenside before the hammer drops on the black king's head. And I think the reason why Lila likes these closed positions so much is because there are less chances to exchange most pieces and getting counterplay is mostly dependent on how well each side executes his plan. And Lila in general is very very fast in her attacks on the king. Most engines can develop enough counterplay before they're hammered into the ground by Lila. So the game continued with knight e7. A logical move since uh, black wants to strike at the center with c5 and also block a possible f pawn attack by white. a4. Now this move has a lot of upsides. Gains more space, prevents bishop a4. At some point might allow a rook a3 lift to the king side. Slows down the black pawn expansion. It might even attack b6 at some point. On the other hand, Stockfish now played a5, fixing it on a light square, so something needs to defend it now all the time. But Lila doesn't care probably much, because now she stopped a bit Black's expansion on the queen side and uh, can focus on her own. f4 and uh, knight f5. Now this move seems to be a bit weird, because uh, Black usually jumps here when the knight is stable on f5, or when it can exchange itself for a white piece in the center. But here, after bishop f2, it looks like the knight will be pushed back with g4 and uh, white will gain valuable time in her attack. Starkfish though had an idea of temporarily sacking the knight for some activity in the center. And this seems to be a good idea because black needs to go for activity and distract white from his attack. Unfortunately for Stockfish, Leila found a beautiful refutation of this idea, as we'll see immediately. So Stockfish takes on d4, and after bishop takes c5, and becomes clear that black will regain his piece by taking one of the bishops. And after bishop f2 and c4, the variation that Stockfish considered was bishop c4, pawn takes, castles, King g8, queen c4, and rook c8, and black has counterplay. White's attack on the king side is kind of stopped because the play shifts into the center. So Stockfish had the right idea for counterplay, but she missed Lila's next move in this position that immediately makes clear that black is not out of the woods at all. On the contrary, white has a much better position. So after black's c4, instead of um, regaining her two missing pawns with bishop takes, she played bishop g6, going for five pawns instead of two, which is uh, usually better. Now of course she won't win literally five pawns, but after the bishop is captured, the black rook is stuck in the corner, completely out of play. And that is like white playing with an extra rook. And it is very difficult for black to get the rook out by moving the king out of the way. If king e7, then uh, bishop h4 is good. If king e8, then f5. And rook f8 now is not so good after f6. And there are many variations here, but nothing is good. After pawn takes, g7, rook g8, queen check, king e7 and pawn takes, the king can take because of the bishop and after king d6 these pawns are just too strong. If instead of rook f8 e takes e6 bishop here bishop there queen e7 defending g7 rook b1 rook f8 rook takes on b6 
rook c8, queen e5, rook f6, and uh, finally the rook is uh, doing something, but rook b8, bishop b7, defending the rook, rook takes on h6, and black can take, so rook f8, rook h7, and rook back to g8, and black's play feels like patching a leaking boat in the middle of the Atlantic, not fun at all. But despite the fact that the rook can get out by moving away the king, Stockfish was still optimistic because she calculated that she will eventually get the g6 pawn with the bishop. So she played now king g8 to allow the queen to get to f5. c3 blocks the d5 pawn, queen f8, queen g4, queen f5, takes, takes, and rook b1. And Lila calculated that she will be able to defend the pawn laterally with the rook. Stockfish played rook b8 and was still optimistic that she will get the pawn on g6. But Lila now played g4, a move completely missed by Stockfish. And at first sight, it's very hard to understand what this move accomplishes. But as soon that it was played, Stockfish realized that it's lost because she won't get the g6 pawn. If black ignores the pawn, then white plays rook h5 and pawn takes, and black won't be able to liberate his rook and will lose. In the game, Stockfish took on g4, and now e6 is very strong. If the bishop takes, then after rook h5, black won't be able anymore to take the g6 pawn, not even after g3, bishop takes and bishop g4, because the rook can stay on the 5th rank and deny the bishop the f5 and h5 squares. So Stockfish, instead of taking on e6, took on a4 with this idea. King d2, defending c2, bishop attacks the pawn, but now f5 b5, seeking some counterplay, but black is playing essentially with the rook down. Now Lila proceeds with uh, blocking these pawns, rook a1, a4, rook b1, threatening that because of the pin, rook c8 and bishop h4, caging in the king, g3, black doesn't really have many moves, king e3, bishop c6, bishop takes, king f8, Bishop d6, keeping an eye on the pawns and liberating this rook from this task. King e8 and rook f1, preparing the final breakthrough. Rook there, bishop back, and now, out of desperation, d4, seeking some activity. Pawn takes and bishop d5. f6, threatening mate. If the pawn takes, then uh, rook f6, and if rook g8, then rook f1, renewing the mating threat. So after f6, Stockfish took on e6 instead, but after f7, Lila is getting a new queen. King d7, and surprise surprise, instead of queen, Lila promotes to a rook, which is uh, just as winning, so it doesn't really matter. And after king c6, the game was adjudicated as a win for Lila. The game lasted only 41 moves, which is uh, quite surprising at this level, but this was a very well played game where Lila reduced the rook on aj to a simple spectator of the game. Let's see what happens next. Lila is currently one point ahead. I put a link in the description where you can follow the competition. If you are new to my channel, then uh, please consider subscribing, and if you enjoy this game, then maybe you want to see these two also. Check them out. Thanks for watching and see you soon.